my favorite sponsor and your favorite sponsor, apparently, because you guys have been going to PalomaVerdeCBD.com and using code BUCK for 20% off your order quite a bit. I've become their best advertiser and I'm happy to do that for them because I love them as people. They're a wonderful family. They support this show and I love their products. They've got all kinds of things, including some new ones because of this new farm bill that's been passed. They've got, of course, regular full spectrum unflavored CBD tinctures. They've got these new THC V gummies. They've got the massage oil you know about. They've got the sleeping bundle if you guys need some help sleeping. If you're sore, they have these CBD bath bombs, but me personally, I have to go for the cool menthol sports cream if you guys lift and work out. It's the most effective sports cream I've ever used. They've got things for your pets, the CBD dog chews, pet tinctures. They've got so much CBD salve. A lot of the stuff now has this THCV in it, and it's a minor cannabinoid found in the cannabis sativa strain. It's isolated from the hemp plant for their line. A lot of people call it diet weed. Anyway, go check it out. They're wonderful people. These products are really good. They work, I promise you that. I use the products that I advertise. Let's put it that way. And again, it's at palomaverdecbd.com. Enter promo code BUCK at checkout. It gets you 20% off of your order. Let's get to the show. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. Thanks for being here with me this week. And I suppose if you follow, if you subscribe to the YouTube page, you probably saw the video I put out last week that it was just me, no guest, because the episode that dropped last week with Father John Peck called Orthodoxy vs. the New World Order, I could not put that one on YouTube. So it is on the Rumble page. And because of that, a lot of you guys discovered the Rumble page. So thanks for finding your way over there. For those of you who like that site better than YouTube, all of these will be on the Rumble page. So go there and search Counterflow with Buck Johnson. Hit subscribe and you'll get notified every week when these come out. Like this one's going to come out. I think this one will also be on YouTube. I think this one is safe enough. Let's hope. Let's cross our fingers because this is one I've been wanting for a long time. I've been contacting Father John Valadez back and forth. We've emailed and DM'd on Instagram. And finally, we were able to put this one together. He's the man in charge of the Death to the World website, all their merchandise, the magazine itself, the zine, if you will. And if you're saying, well, Death to the World, what is that? It's a zine, as they say, to inspire the truth seeking and soul searching amidst the modern age of nihilism and despair, promoting the ancient principles of the last true rebellion, to be dead to this world and alive to the other world. So we get into the history of the zine again, and then we tie a lot of things into that, the falseness of the modern world, modern society, the flimsiness, the lack of virtue, so much virtue signaling, right, is the inverse of actual virtue. And Father John talks about his history in the punk rock scene and the counterculture movement and how there were some questions, the right questions maybe were being asked in certain countercultures, but the right answers were not always being put forth. And so Father John Valadez now is part of the ultimate rebellion, the ultimate counterculture, and he gets into why that is appealing or should be appealing to you guys. And uh, the fact that, well, there's answers in this counterculture, this particular one. So we get into a lot of good stuff, the old punk rock scene. We talk about Father Turbo, who will be my guest next week. Spoiler alert there. So I've already dropped that hint. So we can welcome now the head man over at the Death to the World website and zine and all of those good things. Father John Valadez, welcome to the show, sir. How are you? I'm well, thank God. Uh, wonderful to be here with you. I'm, I'm so excited to do this. I've wanted this one for a long time. Uh, so, so thank you. We're going to get into all kinds of fun things. Your, um, the zine that you now put out has had a big impact on me, Death to the World. And so, uh, and, and I've, 
I've spoken with Justin Marler on mm-hmm. this show, uh, with Father Turbo on this show, and now you, it feels like the counterculture trifecta has has finally uh, arrived with, with you yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> and and those guys both had an, an impact on your life. I, I assume so, correct? Yes, yes right. most definitely. Um, before we get into everything, give my audience anything that you think is pertinent that they should know about you, and then we'll jump in. Um, my name is Father John Valadez. I'm a priest in the Antiochian Archdiocese um, out in Lompoc, California, which is just a little small town on the central coast. Uh, St. Timothy Orthodox Church is my parish. I am married, have five children, and run this death to the world zine that I was blessed to be able to take hold of. Let's Well, let's get into that because I, I don't want to speak over the heads of, of my audience, and that's not a knock on them, but I, I come from a counterculture, subculture world. Um, zines were uh, a thing. And so that's that's part of why when I first saw yours, I thought, oh my God, it's like uh, Maximum Rock and Roll or something uh, that I had seen growing up. So yeah. explain the zine aspect of everything and then and then kind of what death to the world represents. Okay. So like you said, zines in, in these counterculture subcultures, they're popular, they're circulated around. Um, there are zines about all kinds of things. When I was in punk rock and going to shows and stuff, I'd see zines about all different kinds of stuff. Zines about gardening, zines about um, just poetry, zines with art in it, um, zines that were like pointing out things wrong in culture or protesting things or whatever. Um, and the whole concept of them, where they were, they were all written um, and put together, usually cut, cut and pasted together. Um, and then photocopy it on a Xerox machine and um, then passed out at the show at shows, stapled together and passed out at shows. And um, what somebody could do was to take that zine and to run copies um, again and pass that out at another show. So it circulated kind of in these underground veins, if you will, um, and passed out. And um, this is how the audience would grow just by word of mouth and um, people being able to copy them themselves, right? So um, Death of the World was made to be able to, I guess, run through these avenues of these this subculture um, scene, counterculture scene. And so it was put together like that by Justin Marler in the very beginning and the monks in the very beginning. Um, I have at my house actually the the first copied, glued together oh. uh, zines that they used to copy from um, at the Xerox. Uh, back then it was a Kinko's. Now it's FedEx or something like that. Mm-hmm. Or cop- or any kind of copy store or whatever. Um, so that's how it was put together. And um, they, they chose this name, Death to the World. It is from a quote from St. Isaac of Syria. Basically, the quote talks about the passions um, being the definition of world, of the world. And he asks the reader to see which passions um, are alive in you and which passions are dead. And then you will know how far you are alive to the world and how far you are dead to the world. So they um, took this name um, kind of to grab people, you know, as a hook um, to grab people in. And they advertised it actually in the Maximum Rock and Roll uh, magazine in the 90s. And it really did spread like wildfire um, in the very beginning, especially um, in the early 90s. The passions thing I want you to address really quick because there's going to be people, uh, including my former self, they would hear that initially and go, well, passions, why would you want those to be dead to the world that passion it's a good thing you know i have passion for beauty or life or or love like explain that and and i don't want to uh even influence what you're going to say but my i have heard it as the passions are the inversions of of god's gifts but um i'd like you to give your explanation as well yeah that's a i mean that's a great way to explain it um from saint maximus the confessor he talks about that a lot that um we were we were um, created with 
certain passions. Um, anger, for instance, is a very good one, right? Where we were created to have anger, but this anger was supposed to be towards evil, towards injustice, right? And this is how we're supposed to use this passion of anger. Um, but in many respects, in our fallen state, we use anger for a um, self-gratification, right? We get angry at things that are not going our way, or we get angry at people who offend us, or we get angry at this or that, right? So it's used um, it's used in a way that was never intended for it to be used, right? So it's a it's a perversion of the pa- a passion that was inherently given to us. And we see this with lust. We see this with gluttony, all these kinds of things. Um, it was supposed to be a craving for love, a craving for the things of God, right? And we, um, it, we pervert them and distort them. And therefore, um, sin is really a sickness, right? It's when we use our bodies the wrong way, we eat the wrong way, all that kind of stuff, we get sick. And so it's the same thing spiritually when we misuse these passions, um, our souls become sick. And so dying to these passions that cause us sickness is allowing us to be alive, spiritually alive, especially spiritually alive before God, if you know, we we want to correctly talk about it, you know. Did did the zine initially when it was put out by by the monks, including Justin, is that part of what pulled you into orthodoxy? How did that? How did the meeting basically of you finding death to the world happen, and then orthodoxy as well? If we can tie it all in. Yeah. So um, I was a. Uh, I went to the Bible study that Father Turbo started in his tattoo parlor, and um, for your listeners who haven't heard, you know that interview with him. Basically. We, we were part of a kind of subculture, uh, Protestant punk rock scene in Southern California. And when bands, that, that was really our church. We had a church on Sundays, but at least for me personally, that was really my church. We, we would meet at different venues every weekend or at different churches every weekend. These bands would play music, um, punk rock music. We'd, mo- we'd be in the mosh pit and have crazy spiked hair and all kinds of things. And um, afterwards, they would bust out acoustic guitars and play Protestant worship um, at the very end. And um, so this is really our church. And the what I what drew me into that was that um, they all preached a radical Christianity that I was not encountering in my Protestant churches that I was visiting or going to. So they would preach slogans like, no compromise um, of our faith, um, being dead to the world, um, the kingdom of uh, of God being not of this world, things like that. They were very, and and they were very anti the American dream, the white picket fence, and nuclear family, and all this kind of um, stuff. That uh, the see, it seemed like many of the Protestant churches I was going to was embracing. Right, so I already had this distaste for. American culture in my mouth, um, being in the Protestant, be, being in the punk rock scene, the secular mm-hmm. punk rock scene, right? And yeah. so this drew me in when I became a Christian. This scene itself, because it it also had a distaste for for kind of fake plastic American culture, but it had this twist on it that salvation is in Christ, and it's not like the Sex Pistols who say that there is no future, you know, and there, there's nothing beyond, right? It's just pure nihilism. So I was really, really um, kind of involved with friends um, in this punk rock, this Protestant punk rock scene. And, um, but after a while, bands started to move or break up or whatever. And we kind of weren't left with the same community as we had been so used to. And so Father Turbo's Bible study really was the correction to all of that. It gave us a place to go to, a place to sit down with like-minded um, people. And um, we'd study, we do Bible study after the tattoo machines shut off and everything uh, on Monday nights, sometimes from you know 11 o'clock at night till the sun came up the ne- next day. You know, we 
it was really a uh, a great and inspirational time in my life that I'll always uh, cherish a lot. And he, um, it was it was not known to me, but he had been uh, having his run-ins with Orthodox Christianity and. Um, some other people in the Bible study were also having their run-ins with orthodoxy and he decided to convert. And so one night I showed up to the Bible study and he said, oh, he gave this, he gave this uh, study on how Satan can easily deceive people, right? And um, then at the end of the Bible study, he said, this is the last Bible study I'm ever doing because my family is becoming orthodox. And um it was like a sack of bricks that hit everybody. Um, at least people I didn't know, like me, what was going on. And I had already um, committed myself to becoming his apprentice at the tattoo shop. And so I was thinking, what am I getting myself into? Um, I even like had these temptations or delusions that like, oh, maybe I'm put as an apprentice to like save Turbo from this weird Catholic stuff. Oh you know, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> you know, things like that. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but as, as working as a, his apprentice, we just talked about uh, orthodoxy all the time and people would come in. Um, what was wonderful about um, Father Turbo and, and when he was tattooing at that shop was it was revol- people were just coming in like revolving door all the time to ask spiritual questions of him or talk about things. And so, Orthodoxy came up a lot because of this whole thing that had taken place. And so I started trying to go and find things about Orthodoxy. So I went to my public library. That was my first place and found like the three books on the shelf Mm. (laughs) about Orthodox Christianity. Um, One of them was a book um, by Frederica Matthews Green. Mm Mm-hmm. And I picked up that book and I started reading it. And she talked about visiting California and going to this coffee shop, not of this world coffee shop uh, slash bookstore and running into these death to the world magazines and youth of the apocalypse book. Right. So it really caught my attention. So I emailed her and she forwarded my email to um, who is now Bishop Garossum um, in Fort Worth. Yeah. That book that's mm-hmm. like $500. Oh my yeah, no kidding. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So she forwarded my email. Um, Bishop Grossman was then the abbot up there in Platina, St. Herman of Alaska, where the zine started. And uh, he sent me an entire box full of Depths of the World magazines and like six or seven copies of Youth the Apocalypse book. And I brought him to the tattoo shop and we started going through them and we um, realized that a lot of the lyrics from the Protestant punk scene that we were in and a lot of the slogans and everything were taken verbatim out of these Deaths of the World books and Youth of the Apocalypse book, right? And uh, I guess the monks had gone in the 90s to a festival Mm -hmm. and picked it up from. And so everything that I fell in love with, with Christianity was actually orthodoxy i was just never told it was Mm -hmm. so that's how i ran into it and in typical zine fashion we started to unstaple them and make copies of them and pass them out at shows and that sort of thing and um i asked the monks you know when new issues were going to be made and they didn't really have too much time for it they were um, translating things and that kind of stuff and so, um, uh, Bishop Grossum, uh, as the abbot, he asked us, you know, why don't you guys put it together and send it up here and we'll read through it and then bless you to print it if, you know, if it's worthy to be printed. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, and thank God it was worthy to be printed. And so that's how we started uh, in the very beginning is uh, cutting and pasting the zines together, sending it up to the monastery, getting a blessing and then printing them ourselves and uh, distributing them. What year was that? That was in 2000 and... It was either 2004 or 2005. 
Okay. Maybe 2006, actually. 2006 is, sounds right. Yeah. The, the, there must have been a time where you guys kind of took a break because it seems like there's a resurgence in the, in the um, merchandise and printing of, of newer ones. Is that the case? Yeah, it is. Um, in the beginning, we had like a good handful of people that were putting it together. Um, in 2006, and we went out to festivals and uh, to like Cornerstone Festival, which is a big yeah. Protestant festival and things like that. Um, we did that like two or three times uh, when we went out. And um, but then, you know, friends started to go to college or get married and move somewhere else um, that were involved in it. And so that, um, you know, the the manpower behind it really wasn't there anymore. Um, I had gotten married. I uh, had our first son, then the second, then we went to seminary um, and things like that. So there was just not enough time to really dedicate to it uh, in the time that it that it that it deserves, really. Um, until recently, uh, when I was able to kind of find my groove in the parish here after I was assigned mm-hmm. and uh, get some people to to help with the printing and the the media and all that kind of stuff. Were you surprised by the by the response to putting new issues in? And it seems to me like it's become like a quick, a hot item where if you put something up, you know, I've, I've got to be a subscriber to y'all's Patreon. I proudly do that to give you money. But if I didn't do that, I'm afraid that they'd be sold out because we as pa- <laughs> Patreon donors, we get like the early notice. Were you surprised at the demand for this? Um, in some respects, yes. And then others, no. Um, and I just say no because um, to when I was for before I took it over um, and was helping out with the printing of everything, I was I was really drawn to it, heavily drawn to it. And in in the times of those you know periods where there was that lull of not printing new things, like you said, I would I I had a, many temptations of like. You know, I can't, I, we just can't do this. Maybe we should just like shut it off, like shut it down, you know? Um, but every time I'd get those temptations, I, I had to go to the mail, the, the email box and find emails from people who are still becoming Orthodox when finding the website, you know, and we weren't even like updating anything or doing anything really. We we're in this lull or whatever. And so people were still like so attracted to it and still uh, posting about it and still reading it. And so even when we weren't doing anything, God was still wordy, working through it. And so um, when we picked it up again, just this past few years to really get it going and devote the time that it really deserves, I wasn't super surprised that it, that it, that it picked up so well. Um, but I, but at the same time, I, I am surprised sometimes with how fast mm-hmm. things, things go. You know, we we do it out of our house. We do all the shipping and stuff out of our house. So um, anyone who gets late shipments or whatever, I ask their, for their forgiveness. <laughs> we have five <laughs> kids running around and and just a small like five by eight foot section of our house has... Death World's international shipping <laughs> department in it. Um, so we can only stock as much as we can fit as well, you right. know? Right. But I feel like even if we had a bigger space, it'd be really hard to keep everything, you know, um, in stock all the time. When I first met Justin in person here at uh, my local church, he was there for, he was a, sp- a godfather to uh, a guy getting baptized at my church. He, he and I spoke for a while and he said, you know, there's this resurgence of interest in orthodoxy. And he kind of looked down at his arms and, and mine and he said, from people that look like we do. And he said, I, it's almost strange to me, but I, I think it's wonderful. Um, and he goes, I don't really know what it is. I found it ironic, of course, the man that created Death to the World. It's like, you don't know what it is. Come on, <laughs> you must know what it is. But I, I want to ask you, wh- I'm sure you've seen this, of course. What do you think the draw t- towards orthodoxy is for, uh, for for subculture, counterculture people? Um, I guess I can speak a little bit by from personal experience, maybe. Um, the punk rock scene and the rock and roll scene 
and they satisfied like an angst that I had, I guess, and uh, a recognition, which I think is a true recognition of the um, plastic material uh, American culture not being able to satisfy some kind of deep yearning um, within a person and something about it being fake, right? And um, it was able to pinpoint those things and address those things in an angsty way, but it was never able to give any solution to them, you know? Um, and that was the big downfall that I experienced uh, with friends and others who, once they had all these things pointed out to them about corruption and materialism and all these things going on in our culture, the lies and this and that, um, then there's no solution, you know, given to them. And so a lot of the time, it, the scene that maybe started out as tantalizing for speaking the truth became a downward spiral into drugs or um, alcoholism. And, and it became uh, very much what it sought out to um, kind of dispel or to rebel against, you know? Yes. Even the materialistic aspect, like you're, you're, you're dressed like a punk rocker with tight jeans and band shirts and spiky hair, but then somebody else comes in, you're like, oh, he bought that shirt from some mall store. What a poser, you know? So it's like the materialism was still there just in another way. And, and that's what happens with, with uh, false rebellion like yes. that. Like that's the world has the last true rebellion. And that's what happens with the false rebellion because although we're able to uh, um are they able to like pinpoint all of the evil in modern society there's no addressing how it has affected us and how we need to die to that as well and how we need to change it you know so the passions are still all there and in many respects the passions are fed um in this underground scene and so i i feel like um when somebody's devoted their lives to that they they end up just hitting a wall because there's no there's no uh fix you know to to the broken world around them and orthodoxy offers that fix and the the ascetical lives of of the saints um show this drastic rebellion against the false uh spirit of of the world that we're living in but it gives a hope right they're rebelling for a specific reason and they're rebelling in order to have their souls come alive and they were they're rejecting the world because they know that there's life in it right and and they become these perfect human beings that show forth Christ's true image and so it's transcendent, you know, rather than it being this truth that is just kind of a earthly rebellion, it becomes a transcendent one. Mm -hmm. And I think there, I think people are looking for that, you know. Um, I've said it before to people, and I think it's very true that there's a asceticism or a kind of liturgical spirit even in the punk rock scene, you know, I think there's a, there's, we're, we're, we're inherently wanting to be litur like liturgic people, uh, liturgizing people and um, ascetic people, you know, um, and it, and it just takes on a different, a different form wherever somebody's at, you know, like I have parents who are not Orthodox and they, um, you know, will be weirded out at me, like going to Alaska, uh, to a monastery or going some, going to San Francisco to see somebody's, uh, you know, uh, the relics of St. John or something like this. Right. But they'll like go eat at a restaurant that's owned by like their favorite celebrity or <laughs> go to a house or go somewhere where a movie was created or whatever that they like, or whatever it may be. It's the same thing. They're just, they're making pilgrimage it, the pilgrimages. Yes. for these worldly interests that they're into. And the punk rock scene is the same, right? Like 
people eat a certain way, they'll wash certain things, they'll dress a certain way, they they stick to these sort of ascetic rules um, that punk rock or metal scenes might preach. But then there's no end to it, you know? There's no, why are we doing this? It's not transcendent, you know? Um, and orthodoxy offers a solution, right? And offers uh, transcendence because it speaks the truth about this world and the falseness of this world, but it gives uh, gives a life that is that is spiritual um, and that um, has a solution to everything that that we're experiencing today. Do you guys miss purely political talk on this show? Because if you do, well, I hope you're enjoying what we're doing, but there are still great outlets for purely political and fun libertarian shows amongst the top of that list should be Lions of Liberty. I love these guys. I've known Brian and John for a long time. Lions of Liberty is one of the greatest and longest running libertarian slash anarchist podcast networks in the world, quite simply. They started a long time ago, so they know what they're doing. On Monday, John Odermatt delivers a powerful mix of inspiration, health, and faith to set your mind, body, and soul free with Finding Freedom. That's his show. And then of course, every Wednesday, Y'all know Brian McWilliams will make you laugh at all this craziness going on in this world. He even provides a bit of a promise of a better future with his show, Mean Age Daydream. And then Friday, they include shows like Meme Wars or Hate Watch, or of course, a show that I was on myself, The Infamous, or is it just famous? I don't know, but it's libertarians in living rooms drinking liquor. That's on Fridays. That was a very fun show to be a part of. If you go back, in their old episodes of that one. I think uh, there's some quite hilarious moments in there. Lions of Liberty is the first step to finding freedom. Listen today to the Lions of Liberty Network everywhere podcasts are found. Let's get back to this show. Did you experience either yourself or or people coming from the counterculture scene uh, knocking basic Christianity and it being not orthodoxy because they didn't know orthodoxy, but they're they're knocking, let's say, the rock band Bible Church with the TED Talk pastor kind of thing. Did you see people knocking something because they had this almost you would call it a straw man idea of what actual Christianity is, versus they discover orthodoxy and it's like whoa 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 this is not what I have been knocking. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. You know. Um, I think it kind of, and I think Nietzsche hit it uh, the nail on the head when he said that Christianity is, um, what do you say? Like it's like it has too much femininity, you know. Um, they didn't have this bold manliness to it, you know, and therefore he he um, looked down upon it, and that, and, and I think that kind of spirit is very uh, prevalent in in. Um, counterculture scenes because they haven't experienced that manly courageous spirit that orthodoxy has you know um and that manliness is a a a spiritual manliness right i mean it's in the hymns to even female saints who are martyrs or or Mm -hmm. those who are who went into great contest against tyrants and their martyrdom will say that they have a manly spirit, right? And it's, it's about the the boldness and the courageousness of um, of the saints in the face of even threats of death from the world, you know. And I think modern Christianity is very much lacking that. One of the the voices that spoke to me, maybe even before I discovered death to the world, quite possibly so. Uh, was Seraphim Rose, Father Seraphim Rose. I would call him a saint. Um, and then once I discovered death to the world, I mean, he's throughout, uh, you know, and which that was attractive to me as well. Can you speak to um, your first discovery of Father Seraphim and what he means to you and what you think he means for Orthodox Christianity and and, and the world at large? Yeah. Um, the first time I encountered Father Seraphim was Father Turbo was reading his biography and it was on uh, a table in the tattoo shop. 
And I just remember like, who is this guy with this long dreaded beard? Like, what is he reading? You know, what is he reading about? He looked like somebody from some ancient like time, but here we have this picture in color of this guy, you know? And so that was the first time I ever encountered him um, is just looking at his face and wondering who, who is this guy? You know, who is this person? And then later um, I read about him in Death of the World issue two. They put together his whole life in there. And then I got um, Orthodox in the Religion of the Future. Um, one of my friends was dabbling uh, in like the charismatic um, Protestant world. Um, and they wanted to become Orthodox, but their family was uh, very anti them becoming Orthodox. I kind of want to see what this was all about, you know, and he, he addresses speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff in that book. And so that was really one of my first Orthodox uh, like books, like, I guess that were, that's like theological, I guess. Um, and so it hit me hard. I mean, his, his whole life hit me hard because I was born in Southern California. I grew up in Southern California. Um, I visited places that are very close to where he was born and where he went to college. And I've been to San Francisco for like punk shows and stuff and was close to where he lived and all that kind of stuff. And so his life was so incredibly palpable, I guess, because I lived in the places that he lived you know, and experienced many of the same things that he experienced. And um, seeing what he did and how he and 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 how he devoted himself to Christ was just absolutely uh, mind boggling, you know, it left me with my jaw on the floor because in the church we read about so many saints. And, um, and so many modern saints too, but many of those modern saints are from Greece, from Athos, from, um, parts of Russia. And, but here we have this figure, you know, that, that, um, has, that embodies all of these types of saints throughout the, the world and in the past, but living in Southern California and walking the streets of San Francisco and that kind of a thing. It was just really inspiring. I think that's what he offers to the world. He, he has lived out the experience that so many people have experienced. You know, even, in, even in Greece, they had, huge, um, they had a huge kind of, I don't know, infiltration of... Eastern mysticism and stuff like that, you know, um, like that book, um, The Guru of the Young Man and Elder Paisios, that mm -hmm. book, um, it shows that pretty, pretty well. And, and some of St. Paisios' writings and other, other uh, saints that lived at his time, you know, um, addressed the issues of, uh, of yoga and Eastern mysticism and gurus and stuff like that. So it was definitely a temptation. Um, even in Greece itself, you know, and Father Seraphim experienced it here firsthand. And so he's not only, not, not only do I love him because he's this local saint that embodied so many aspects of like local life that are here in California and throughout the United States, but worldwide, he has, he has experienced so much and written so much that speaks orthodoxy to the modern soul. Um, quite effectively. Yes. Yeah. Well put. Uh, one of the things in the newer death to the world, um, the website and, and the issues you've, you guys, uh, you know, in plural, I know father Zechariah Lynch, who's been on this show has addressed it is some of the things we saw over the last few years. And I've got to be super careful on how I say them. I'm resting on strike number two and I can't get a third one or I, I'm done from YouTube. <laughs> but so be kind in your wording. But what did you see um, from your perspective over the last two to three years of, of, of 
of what went on? What's you, what's your version of what went down? Um, I see that there's this. Um, I guess I got to put it. I got to put it right. Um, the spirit of the Antichrist is is growing in its influence, um, is how I would put it. You know, Father Seraphim spoke about how in his time, there was never a time of mass apostasy since the time of Christ until the modern, until his modern time, right? Um, his present time, and that was late 70s, you know, early 80s or so. And so we can definitely say it even more so now. There's never been a time since Christ that the world has been seduced by the spirit of the Antichrist in on the on the scale that it has, you know. And what we saw was an attack on human life. We saw an attack on the church itself. And from within and from without, uh, outside of it. And so I think that it was a great time of um, testing that got allowed um, this to happen um, so that we would be tested. And hopefully we would learn from all of it so that if something like this happened next time, we would be more bold in our faith. You know, our fathers and in times before us would be, I think, so ashamed of how it was all handled. We see recent, even very recent epidemics and other things where the priests and the bishops, they took miracle working icons and they processed outside. And they did more liturgies. They did more services. They implored God more, you know, and we responded by shutting our churches down and by bishops telling their priests that they could not do things like holy unction, which is just absolutely insane that anybody would not do holy unction during a time of sickness. Explain what that is for the secular folks listening. Holy Unction is a service in the church. It's a special service um, where usually, you know, in in its fullness, seven priests would read prayers over um, holy oil, oil, make it holy, uh, sanctify the oil, call the Holy Spirit down upon the oil. And then all of the uh, people there, or like if there's one person who's sick, maybe has cancer or something like this, um, they do Holy Unction just for that person. Um, but we do this like on a mass scale, at least in the Greek practice and Antiochian practice, we do this on Holy Wednesday evening and where everybody is anointed with holy oil. And it's it's for the curing of both soul and body. So it's a really beautiful set apart service. And we always have always done it in times of sickness, in times of disease. And um you know, many hierarchs instructed their people not to, their priests not to, you know, do these things. So we we voluntarily withheld sacraments. Mm-hmm. We voluntarily withheld um, grace, you know, during that time, which is just absolutely um, mind-boggling. I'm sure our holy fathers who died for these kinds of things um, and were dismembered for these kinds of things were crying from their graves. Mm-hmm. In your experience, when, well, let me ask you this first. Did your parish after, did it grow because of, of some of the things that have been going on? Did you find people seeking something deeper than, than the material? Yes, definitely. definitely. Excellent. And your experience then, and I guess it doesn't have to be just just the new people from the last few years, but just new people in general. I have <laughs> experienced this, and I've spoke. My priest warned me, and Father Turbo warned me, and I've heard now other priests discuss it. 
when someone becomes a catechumen or starts getting into the Orthodox Church, their life gets harder. Have you seen that as well? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that, the laugh, the mischief. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Talk about that. I I think there's a I think it's pretty solid um within the experience of the church that there is this period of grace after baptism. And then at a certain point, the rug is just pulled out from underneath you a bit, you know, and the temptations and the struggles begin. And I, um, people that go through that, I like to give them this story of uh, that St. Paisios. Some people, some people asked him, uh, you know, why, why do I not feel God's grace sometimes? And why do I feel it strong at other times? You know, can you talk about that or whatever? And he, and he gave this wonderful, just like little, um, story where he talked about how when he plants tomatoes, he, um, plants them inside and he moves them from one, uh, one window to the next, depending on where the sunlight is. So he's kind of painting this whole picture that he's babying this, these little seeds and he babies them as their seedlings and all kinds of this, all this kind of stuff. And he's talks about, you know, really tenderly how he rejoices when they sprout and that kind of a thing. And, and he says when he has to plant them outside though, he puts them outside and he neglects them. So he doesn't water them. He doesn't talk to them anymore. And um, then he said, right before they're about to die, then I began to nurture them again. I give them water and this kind of thing. And he says, the reason why he does this is so that the roots of the tomato plant grow deeper on their own. And so that when they're watered again, they'll bring forth much more fruit than they would if I were to baby them the entire time, even when they're outside. And so I think um, it's within the living tradition of the church that God does this sort of thing with us. You know, when we first become Orthodox, we're like these little seedlings that he moves in into these spots of grace all of the time. And so we're experiencing a lot of the blessedness that comes with being uh, newly initiated into the church. Um, but then there comes a time where he wants us to struggle a little bit and wants he wants us to grow deeper roots and be planted outside. And so we start to feel the harshness of the weather, you know, um, the harshness of not being watered all of the time um, or being spoken to all of the time. And so this is this blessed struggle that he allows us to go through, this contest that he allows us to go through so that we push ourselves to pray even when we're not inspired anymore to pray. We push ourselves to be in liturgy even when we're not maybe inspired to be in liturgy. And we're trying to read uh, Lives of Saints even though we're going through all these struggles and temptations and things like that. And we have we're we're trying to force right like like the Lord says that the kingdom of heaven is taken by force right the violent uh, take it by force and so there's this forcefulness that comes into play at some point and that is the roots growing deeper mm. so that when God waters us with His Holy Spirit and with grace uh, that this that the fruits hopefully you know will come more abundantly than they were if we were just babied the entire time. And I think we're so selfish, you know, at least I'm so selfish that if God were to always give me his grace all of the time, I would probably take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And that the, the spiritual struggle might wane because the force is not needed, you know, but these times of uh, drought or, um, temptation make make you want to run after the prize and i think it's beautiful that god reminds us in many ways of the time right after baptism when we are nurtured so much because then we say i want my life to be like that again you know i want my life to be like those few months or those few weeks Again, it was so grace filled. So I know that I can get there. I know that I can do it, you know? Um, and so we're inspired to try to always uh, get back to this time where we, we felt his 
presence so much. And uh, of course, he allows us to, to, to experience it and to um, live in that grace and everything. But this is, is this constant back and forth with us, you know, when we're, when he feels like we need to grow bigger roots, he allows things to happen. One of the things that caught me completely off guard, and, and when I, I suppose this podcast has been somewhat of a journey as I take it. And so I didn't purposely say, I'm going to make more orthodox epi- episodes. It just happened as my life heads in this direction. I completely had no idea some of the things I was going to experience, that's for sure. Um, but one of the things would be people writing to me, asking me questions about it. And it's like, hey, I'm, I am, huh, I can send you to people to ask questions. <laughs> I am not by any means even close to an expert. But then some people want say, no, I want some of the, the things that you first discovered. I want to talk to you about that because they're, they're looking to discover that. So I get that. But could you speak to some of, the, I know right now there's someone hearing this in their speakers or their earbuds or their TV. And they're thinking, I am curious about this orthodoxy thing, but I'm just, I just don't think I'm a religious person. I don't know. It seems to scare me uh, for whatever reason. They, there's a multitude of excuses or barriers that are going to be thrown up in, in front of people. What would you offer to someone who's, let's call it ortho curious and, and, any advice or suggestions or thoughts on that? I would say that Christ is calling you, you know, and we all have a void in our life that cannot be filled by anything other than the sweetness of Christ. Um, St. John Chrysostom gives this wonderful image of Christ as a mad lover. He says, you know, when somebody falls in love with someone else, you know, you can picture um, how they do crazy things that they would never do um, otherwise. You know, they they write poems and they drop flowers and they do all these kinds of things, right, that are just so not who they really are or something. They're out of their mind in some way. And St. John Chrysostom paints Christ like this in this state where he is a man lover running after everyone's souls. and. So every single soul, he is dropping um, flowers, if you will, and throwing rocks at our window, if you will, and trying to bring us to him who's our heavenly bridegroom. And so all of this um, darkness that is in this world and all of the ways that society has set up false ways to feed us and how much they fail and how much they leave us miserable and all of the sicknesses that we know are in our life that we sometimes hate ourselves for. Christ does not want us to experience any of that, but he's constantly running after us, loving us and wanting to bring us out of the hell that we find ourselves in. Well put. What does, you, you have five kids. You're a spiritual father to many. You're a husband. I mean, my priest and t- my local priest here has two other jobs that are, and he's so swamped and I can't believe, I mean, it's, it's not an easy life. And he's got kids, of course, too. What's a day in the life of Father John Valadez look like? <laughs> um, I... I usually have service every morning. Um, there's a few mornings I don't uh, to be with my kids in the morning, but um, every day we have service here. If it's not a Monday, Monday is my family day. But um, usually wow, every day y'all have a service. Yeah. Wow, I'm jealous. That's cool. <laughs> so usually, like today, today's a little bit of an off day, but today on a Tuesday, I'd wake up, I'd. Uh, get ready, come to liturgy, we'd serve liturgy um, every Tuesday and um, spend some time with the people, probably hear confessions um, after liturgy and then beautify. I've been working on beautifying the church here. So painting and hanging things up and 
things like that, and just some work around the church itself. Um, and then usually go home, spend some time with the family, the kids. On a Tuesday, I would take the kids to jujitsu. They're all, uh, the boys mm -hmm. are all, you know, oldest boys are all in jujitsu. So we'd go there and come home and have dinner together. We eat dinner every night. For the most part, if I'm not at church, we eat dinner every night together as a family and then at the table. And then we have some quality time together after we do family prayers. Um, then it's story time. Then it's song time. Then it's bedtime. And then my wife and I um, are able to spend some time together um, at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, every day changes a little bit with, with house calls or visitations. Um, my wife takes care of a lot of the death of the world stuff um, as far as the the shipping department goes. Um, so I don't have to worry about that too much. Um, sometimes I have to answer emails and things like that. And um, that's kind of about it. We have, we have 22 ducks that we take care of as well. Um, and 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 have eggs from that's kind of our uh, another side hustle is uh, our egg selling um, and things like that. So yeah, it's a packed day, but it keeps me out of trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's still, you know, it's funny. I, I know you've heard this type of this meme of sorts, but as you're describing that, I was like, this is the actual like true punk rock. Re this is the last true rebellion. Yes, yes, yes. I mean. Yeah, it's yeah. just because um, that is literally rebelling against every garbage piece of modernity that society throws at us out there. Is, is what you're doing? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, I've I, seen memes before of like what I thought rebellion was, you know, and it's a bunch of guys with leather jackets and spiky hair, and then what it really is, and it's a 1950s like poster of a family walking to church or something like that, you know. Yes, yeah, I saw something similar, and it. It's basically, it should just both versions should be you. What I thought rebellion was, <laughs> you in the 90s or the early 2000s, what I think, what I know it is, and you now. I mean, that's, that's, that's what this is. They need an orthodox meme wow. of this. So someone listening, send that in to me. Oh, uh, uh, before we get out of here, I always, I like to ask people such as yourself, uh, I, another thing my audience loves and asks me about, any book recommendations? Ooh, yeah, that's a hard one. Um, I... I don't know. Some of my favorite books are um, this book, actually, I have it right here. Someone just gave me a new hardback edition to it. So it's Council. Council, Councils of the Holy Mountain or From the Holy Mountain. It's it's letters by Elder Ephraim of Arizona. Um, they have a beautiful new hardback um, edition that I didn't have before at the Saint, at St. Anthony's uh, Monastery. Nice. website um and then father seraphim's life and works but unfortunately it's out of print right now yeah it is it's like super hard to find and it's like one of the best books ever yeah um that book is really good and let's see it's like i think those are the two of my favorites well, then I'll let you plug plug away too. You got to plug anything you want, but certainly the death to the world stuff. <laughs> so you can find me of the death to the world stuff at uh, death to the world dot com. Uh, we have social media. If you just type in, I think the handle for everything is death to the world. And um, on the website, you can also find a podcast, the Ecnecron podcast. Yes, very good too. Uh, E K and then another word N E K R O N, and you can find that on the website as well. Ecnicron means from the dead. It's a uh, part from the Troparian for the resurrection. So there's teachings. Those are mostly those are those podcasts are teachings that I do here at the parish every Wednesday. We have classes, um, so you can listen to those. Uh, you can plug and you did that. Orthodox Survival Course on there, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I redid yes. Father Sarah from his Orthodox Survival Course. And I, I shouldn't say redid, I just regurgitated. Yes, uh, it was excellent. It's Survival Course. Um, so those are ways that you can, you can connect. Um, 
And you can always message us through through social media and um, through the website, things like that. And the Patreon, you guys, in that you yes, have. we have a Patreon too, which which we just started, and hopefully are going to do some more stuff there. I'm trying to work on um, having ca- carving out a little bit of time to do video stuff um, for there, and possibly for YouTube, things like that. And where can they find? What's the address? Is patreoncom slash death to the world? I suppose. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Or I'll look. Death to the world website too, and there's a link right on the top for the Patreon. excellent. I'll link to it too in the show notes page for this episode. Uh, any parting words for anyone? Um, have a wonderful... Are you on the new calendar? Do I'm you know? on the old calendar. Oh, the old calendar. So you're going to have a wonderful Christmas. Here yes. yes. Um, and then everybody on the new calendar, have a blessed theophany. Um, and it was wonderful to be with you on, on this show. And I hope that death the world's... Uh, ministry continues to touch people's lives and to bring them closer to Christ. As do I, as it did for me. So thank you so much, Father John Valadez, for that and for being on the show. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. So up front, I told you about the Rumble page. You can go and hit subscribe over there and get all of the videos, even the ones we can't put on YouTube. But you can also go to the YouTube page if you haven't done that yet and subscribe to that. And let's see. Oh, yeah, this club. Hey, I think we have a date for our first Zoom session with these exclusive club members. If you go to patreon.com slash counterflow and become a Patreon donor of at least $5 a month or more, you will be notified of these Zoom calls. It will be myself and anyone who's in this club, anyone who donates $5 a month or more, we're going to have a Zoom call. And so I've got a couple of guests lined up already. And I don't want to give too many details in case something doesn't work out. But if you're part of this club where you donate $5 or more, you're going to get an email notification quite soon here. And it's going to tell you all of the details when our Zoom call is. And again, this will not be on YouTube or Rumble. It will not be in the podcast feed. It's just a private Zoom call with me, a few guests, and everyone who's in this $5 per month or more donation club. Talk, have a Q&A, discuss whatever y'all want. It's going to be fun. So join us. And guys, by the way, I haven't promoted the Telegram group in a long time. We do have that. It's still going strong. Lots of good chats and articles and links and stuff posted in our Telegram group. The Counterflow listeners are, uh, as you probably know, quite based. So good work in the Telegram group. And until next week, when I got Father Turbo for you, y'all have a good one. See ya. But I am the center inside the placenta of math You clash with cyanide gas and die fast Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media Check them out at podsworth.com